Good morning, my name is Sam and I'm one of the pastors here at Faith Church. Welcome to Faith Church. If you're new here with us, we'd encourage you to just type new in the comment section and we'd love to follow up with you. Also, we invite you to follow or subscribe to us on social media. If you're looking to take the next step here at Faith Church, whether it's filling out a digital connect card, finding community in a small group, serving with us in the mission, or supporting us financially, just head over to faithhour.info. Once there, you'll also find a digital bulletin with a Bible reference that aligns with the message you'll hear today. Thanks again for joining us. Let's get started. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. Hey, I see some of your faces out there. Good to see you. And uh, those of you watching online, welcome. We're glad that you're that you're with us today. For the, all, all of you who have been uh, a part of our church for uh, months, years, decades, welcome. We're glad that you're here and uh, joining in the mission. We're starting a brand new series today. It's going to be really good. And I'm excited and very relevant to our current political climate and everything going on. For those of you who are new, uh, watching online or here in the room, what we'd invite you to do is to fill out a digital connect card, which you can find at faithauburn.info. And the whole reason behind that is for for us to be able to connect with you and follow up with you. So if this is your first time or you've been coming for a couple weeks or a couple months, but you've never taken that step to to be known in community, then this is a great next step for you. And when you do that, what, what will happen is you'll get signed up for our weekly email list so you can find out about everything happening at Faith and, and all the developments that are happening through this church and in the community. And so you can do that at faithauburn.info, fill out that digital connect card. And, uh, and once again, thank you for tuning in with us online or being here in the room. And uh, we're excited to uh, embark on a new journey today. Uh, so in just a moment, we're going to hear a message from Pastor Doug, my dad, and, and it's going to be uh, kind of kicking this series off called Talking Points. And uh, it's going to be about 35 minute sermon. Right after that, we're going to uh, hear from Pastor Sam via video. He's going to be um, just talking to us about, about finances and about giving, about being a part of the mission here at Faith. And then after that, we're going to sing some songs together and go out of here rejoicing together uh, as we go out back into, uh, into our community and into the world with the gospel, with the good news of Jesus. So uh, today is going to be a great day. Who's excited to be here? Woo! And those of you watching online, if you're excited to be here, just, you know, type a amen. Ready to, ready to worship, ready to be here in the comments. And... Uh, it's, it's a, a great long weekend here, and thank you for being faithful, for being here uh, for this, this journey as we journey together. One quick thing I want to mention um, is Trunk or Treat is happening at the end of this month, October 31st. And we, we mentioned it last week. This is a, a partnership with the community in the town of Auburn. They, they came to us as we went to them kind of mutually and said we want to do something together. Um, as an alternative for trick-or-treating this year because of COVID, how can we create a safe environment for families? And so this event, uh, we're really excited about. You can sign up at faithauburn.info to decorate your car. Um, You can sign up to be a greeter, to uh, help in various capacities. But uh, we need all hands on deck as this is going to be a community-wide event. And we're anticipating a lot of cars driving through and a lot of people Uh, and a lot of children being blessed by this event. So we want to give back to the community by doing this event and communicate that the gospel is free. The good news of Jesus is free. It doesn't cost anything. It doesn't require anything from us except just surrendering and saying, yeah, I'm in. So to that end, we're going to start a brand new series today called Talking Points. So let's check out this video.
Well, have you ever just wanted to kind of slap somebody? Not the person next to you. Don't do that in church. Um, it was October 2001. It was just a less than a month after 9-11. And uh, I was with a bunch of pastors. Uh, FYI, pastors, when they're away from their congregations, can get a little rowdy, I'm just saying. Um, and, and so this particular group of pastors were just a little bit rowdy, and we were coming back from a conference in Niagara Falls across the border, the Canadian border. We're coming back. Now, as a kid, I remember growing up and, um, you know, going across the border really wasn't any big deal. You know, it was easy. It was just easy, you know, you answered the questions, and you really, I don't even remember having to show any documentation or anything. It just kind of went across. Uh, but this was different. It's a month after 9-11. So, so the security is heightened, and everything is, you know, kind of on DEFCON 5. And, and I remember coming, uh, you know, back across the bridge there at Niagara Falls, and, uh, you know, the... The border guard asked that all familiar question, right? What is it? Do you have anything to declare, right? And the pastor standing next to me, my friend, <laughs> said, I don't have anything to declare but this full belly that I have right now. To which the border guard said, Sir, you are this close from getting thrown in jail. <laughs> To which then he said, what, can't you take a joke? <laughs> Parents, you know the eye? You, you know the eye, right? You, the, the eye that you give your kids. You know the eye, you know? That was the eye that I gave him. It's like, what are you thinking right now? Like, like, like you're gonna get us all in trouble. And, and uh, you know, we found out very quickly that things had changed and the borders had gotten tightened up, and, and you know since then, they're, they're as tightened as ever could be. It's not like it once was. And it's not just the borders separating Canada and the United States. It's the borders that divide us, too. The, the, the things that divide us in our culture, in our nation, those borders have just increased um, so much more in these past few years, haven't they? I mean, you feel it, I feel it, we all feel it. We, we, for all intents and purposes, could kind of say that we're a divided nation. I remember when my uh, dad came back from the big one, right? The war, the big one, World War II. And he said when he was on the street wearing his uniform, he would get thanked by everyone and anyone on the street for his service. And, and he talked to me then, I remember him saying that, uh, there was a sense of national unity at that point. There was such a sense of togetherness that we're one. But gone are those days. We're not living in that kind of culture anymore. We're very separated in our, our culture and our mindset if the debates that you've been watching these last couple of weeks are any indication. Uh, Rodney, help me out with his last name here, Kurt, uh, there it is, right there. Kernigan uh, puts it this way in his article, Speaking the Truth in Life. He says this, Reason discourse is increasing, increasingly giving way to in-your-face sound bites. Hardball is the dominant metaphor for American public life. Our interchanges are confrontational, divisive, and dismissive. Truth is not something we expect to emerge from a conversation it is something we hope to impose. Balance and fairness are casualties on evening shows as two, three, and sometimes four voices contend simultaneously for dominance. Volume and transigence, or, or intolerance, are the new civic virtues. Stubbornness are the new civic virtues. I'm not making this up, am I? Maybe you've seen it, maybe you experience it. You listen to the radio, you watch television, you sense that there's just this massive division out there. Um, Andy Stanley, a pastor from Georgia, uh, kind of puts it this way. There's, there, there are three trends that are kind of going on in the world today, and in our nation specifically, that are kind of lending itself to this kind of divisive spirit. And, and, and he, he first of all says that 
everything, everything is politicized, right? Everything seems to be a, an issue for us, whether Republican or Democrat, masks, are politicized. The wearing of masks are politicized. Whether or not you'll take the vaccine can even be politicized. Football, and especially the national anthem, is politicized and therefore polarized. We're, we're polarized as, as a nation. Andy Stanley goes on to say, and also, cancel culture. Right? If I don't like what you say, I just cancel you out. I write you off. I, I cancel you from my Facebook page. You know, you could say one thing, just one thing that I don't agree with, and therefore what happens? I just dismiss you completely. I know people like this. I, I know individuals like this. Who that, that, that they, are, they go from zero to 60 like that. They say, I don't agree with a candidate on basis on one thing, therefore I don't agree with anything. Or a person, I don't agree with anything. Andy Stanley says there's one more thing, though, that there's a kind of a trend that's been there for a long time. It is this cultural war, Christianity. You know, the church has been kind of highly susceptible to having these culture wars. You know, it's the Catholics against the Protestants. It's, it's the Presbyterians against the Charismatics. It's the Baptists against... Everybody else, right? <laughs> we fight over styles of worship. We fight over the color of the carpet. We, we just fight over ab absolutely everything um, around us in the church. And, and if we're not careful, all of these trends can start to seep in, can't they? And my question, I guess, for us getting through this series is how do we navigate how do we navigate through all of these trends that Stanley and others have kind of said, these are on the forefront, this is what's happening out there in the world. How do we navigate? How does the church kind of answer or be the answer to what's going on out there? So, so we're in this series called Talking Points, which we're, the subtitle is The Perfect Blend of Politics and Religion, if there is such a thing, right? Um, I just want to kind of pay tribute to some of the people who have just been so helpful in this. One is Andy Stanley, uh, Tim Keller, uh, Craig Grishel. These are some of the pastors that I've just been, kind of been listening to over these last several weeks, just trying to figure out how to, how to bring this to you. Um, you know, it's been difficult for me to ignore the subject of religion in all of my years as a pastor. That's what you pay me to do. It's kind of easy, I know. Talking about issues of religion, all right, not too difficult for me. But it's been really easy to ignore the topic of politics for me. I don't know a pastor alive who wants to talk about that topic. We, we just want to kind of push it aside. And, and my feeling is, and as I've listened to some of these other pastors, the reality is, we need to speak somewhat into it because the church can't just take a back seat here on some of these things. We have to kind of stand up and say, wait a second, are we just gonna let some of those trends just go by the wayside and, and that we're gonna be affected by that rather than could we instead be the effectors and the instigators of a new way? Here's my hope through this series. The series is not intended to be divisive. This Sermon series is intended to build some common ground in our midst, to draw us together in this day so that the world can actually look at the church in a new and different light and say, hmm, maybe they are the hope of the world. Maybe they do have a better way. Maybe the church is the solution for what I've been longing for all along. Now, now let me just say from the get-go here, and I want you to understand, we're not a we're not a homogenous church here at Faith Church like my church was back in Western New York. Back in Western New York, man, we all dressed alike, talked alike, uh, believed alike, probably voted for the same candidates. You know, we were just, we were, all, we were all the same. We were just homogenous. We do not have a homogenous church right now, which I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. We're, we're a diverse congregation. Um, 
it was really evident to me that we were diverse because going back to, let's say, a couple months back, we had a July series. Some of you really liked the July series and Liberty for All, and some of you just said, I don't like this. This is, I want to, the church ought not to be talking about these things. And and so we had people on both sides of the spectrum, which kind of tells me, okay, we're diverse. We're very different. And, And when I look at who we are compared to the kind of people that Jesus ministered, specifically the 12 apostles, I don't think that there was a whole lot of difference between who we are and who they were. Do you realize Jesus called a pretty mixed bag of disciples to himself? I mean, they were so spread out across the map in terms of their political views. Uh, First of all, you've got a guy by the name of uh, Matthew, the tax collector. Matthew, the tax collector, is working for Rome. He's a Jewish man who has been hired by Rome to collect taxes for Rome. He is a traitor to almost all Jewish people. He's working for the enemy. So Jesus calls him as one of his merry men, as one of his band. Who else is on that list of 12? Simon the Zealot. (laughs) Simon the Zealot is zealous to push Rome out of Israel. Um, In other words, you've got a man who is a tax collector and you've got a man who is a tax hater. You've got a patriot and you've got a traitor. And both of them are a part of this group that Jesus has assembled to himself. Now, now maybe maybe you'd want to just take Jesus aside and say, excuse me, Jesus, Do you really know what you're doing here? I mean, do you see uh, the incredible political division that you have just brought to yourself and that you've assembled around you? This doesn't make sense. You've got to choose some people who are more like you, kind of the centrist position, right? Wouldn't you want that for a group of apostles who you're hoping are going to change the world? But he doesn't do that. And so these guys are at opposite ends of the political spectrum. And again, I don't know that that's such a bad thing. So our question, our question through this series is going to be something along the lines of this. Is it possible, is it possible to disagree politically and love unconditionally at the same time? Like, is it possible to kind of do these things together that I can respectfully, lovingly, compassionately talk to you about the issues and not necessarily agree with everything that you believe about politics or any other thing for that matter and that we could still love on each other. Or, or to put it another way, here's the, here is the real quintessential question. Are you willing to evaluate your politics through the filter of your faith rather than create a version of faith that supports your politics. In other words, what's gonna come first for you? Is it your politics over your faith or is it your faith over your politics? And and that's a real serious question for us. Because as Jesus looked out at at his disciples, I am sure that he was looking forward into the future and he knew there'd be hard times. He knew there'd be days like this. (laughs) He foresaw 2020 and all of what 2020 was going to bring to us. <laughs> and, and he knew that the culture would have kind of a, a way of, of affecting us and, and almost molding, shaping the church. And he's very much concerned about that. Jesus is absolutely concerned that we not follow in the same pathway of the world. And so that's why the night before he goes to the cross, he prays a prayer. We're looking today at John chapter 17, verses 1 through 23. Let me just tell you that this is the prayer of all prayers. You know, the Bible has so many different prayers of people praying. You know, Daniel the prophet 
praying. We have, we have prayers by Nehemiah. We have pray, just Hannah's prayer in the Old Testament. Just wonderful prayers. But, but, but this is the prayer of all prayers. And, 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 and when you want to just kind of look into the prayers of Jesus, and, and, and as you do it, you're gonna, we're going to kind of see a keyhole. We're going to peek into the relationship that he has with his Father as he is praying to the Father. What's on the heart of Jesus? You know, if you knew you were dying, if you're on your deathbed and you know you're dying, would you be... Uh, would you be content with small talk at that point? Not me. I, I want to I talk about the things that matter most. Like if I know that I've got, you know, only so much time left, I want to talk to the people around me about the things that are most critical, most important. I don't want to talk about the Red Sox. I don't want to talk about the weather. I want to talk about the things that are critical and matter most. And that's what Jesus is doing in this prayer, this high priestly prayer. I mean, you could kind of say that this is the true Lord's prayer. You know, I know that there's another Lord's prayer, but this is the true Lord's prayer. And when Jesus prays, he's praying for something, not only just for his disciples, but he's praying for you. He's praying for us living here in 2020. And he knows it's going to be hard, and he knows it's going to be difficult, but he's praying something to the Father that is going to hopefully make the difference. So we're going to get into this prayer, and, and, I, and I, I'm just praying for us. Because here, let me just kind of put it to you on the line here. There is so much riding on this. Let me just say, these, these are life and death matters. Not the issues of politics. You know, that, that's one thing. But the, the life and death matters that I'm talking about is the very thing that Jesus is praying about here in this passage. And, and us as a church, small C church, big C church, a lot's riding on this today. So I really have to have your attention. We gotta sit up straight on this one. We really, really have to kind of lean into what Jesus is saying here on this. So let's, Let's fire away here. Let's grab this. Father, the hour has come. All throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus has been saying, it's not my hour, it's not my hour, it's not my hour, it's not my time. Because he knows there's a time when he will do what he's supposed to do. He was born to die. This is, this is the hour that Jesus has been preparing for and waiting for all of his life. The hour has come. This is it. He is minutes, literally minutes away from being arrested, sentenced, beaten, scorned, mocked, crucified. Like, like he's on the edge right now, the verge. What's on his heart? Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. The word glorify means to literally um, see something as heavy. It literally meant in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for glory meant heavy or weighty. It means to treat something with value and importance and honor. You know, if you are... Um, if you're in a relationship, if you're married, you know, and you love the person, one of the ways that you love a person is by honoring that person, glorifying that person, as it were. That's kind of what Jesus is talking about here. And he's talking about this intimate bond between the father and the son where one honors the other. And there is this, there's this oneness that exists between honoring each other and valuing each other. And isn't it interesting that the very thing that we would see as horrific, the cross, is something that Jesus sees as honoring. I, 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 he's praying, God, in this moment on the cross, I want to glorify you. Isn't that incredible? What an incredible prayer. But in the midst of it all, Jesus has something else that is on his mind. As he's thinking about his relationship with the Father, he is thinking about something else that is so vital to the years ahead. In verse 11, he says this, I will remain in the world no longer, but they're still in the world, and I am coming to you. Jesus knows something that the disciples don't know yet. 
Jesus is going away. (laughs) Jesus is going to leave them, and they're going to remain. His battle will be their battle. The war he's been fighting will be the war they will need to pick up. They'll need to pick up the mantle now, and they'll need to start fighting the good fight as Jesus has been doing, and Jesus recognizes how difficult this is going to be for them. And so his prayer is this, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me. Protect them, guard them, keep them, spare them, save them. It means all of those things. Protect them from what? So that. It's a purpose clause. You see, this protection has a purpose. Uh, This is not just some willy-nilly prayer request. Oh, protect them, Lord. Protect them from physical harm. You know, protect them. Uh, protect Aunt, uh, Aunt Ethel from the gout that she often feels, you know, protect her from that, Lord. No, no, this is a protection of a much greater magnitude, a much greater level. Jesus is not praying for any kind of physical protection. He's not even pre- uh, praying for them uh, for some spiritual individual protection. It's something so much greater. So that what? So that they may be. Well, we're kind of on the edge of our seats. We want to know, what is Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, praying for, for his disciples? This must be pretty important. So that they may be one. One. That they might come together. Not divided. Not separated. Not not have their opinions about certain things overrule their desire and their need to be one. In other words, this to Jesus is the most important thing. And then he defines that oneness as we are one. All right. I just need to have you see the how spectacular this prayer is. That, that we together in this room here could be one even as Jesus is one with the Father. Have you just even thought through on that? The oneness, the cosmic, supernatural, spiritual oneness that the Godhead has experienced from the very beginning would be ours as well. This kind of spiritual, supernatural dynamic that unites Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity. That that not only would be experienced in heaven, but it would be experienced on earth in us, in the church. I mean, do you see the incredible nature of this? I, I, I mean, notice with me, Jesus isn't just praying that we tolerate one another. Right? It's not just, I hope they get along, Jesus, Father. You know, I just, I just hope that they, um, you know, can they just kind of agree to disagree? You know, um, I know they're going to have their days, but can you just, I mean, try to keep them together as long as possible. It's like your kids, right? Parents, don't you want your kids to kind of get along? But more than that. But don't you want something more? Don't you want something that would kind of bring them together in such a way so that they would say, hey, no matter what, mom and dad, you know, long after you guys are here, we're together. (laughs) We're together. You know, the two or three or four or eight, seven, eight. Some of you got seven or eight kids, man. How do you do it? But, But that you're one, that you come together. And that is what Jesus is praying for here. He's praying for this supernatural oneness. And here's what's even more phenomenal about the prayer, that Jesus is not just praying for them. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Jesus is seeing down the road, and he's seeing you and me. In other words, he's seeing those people who will will hear the message of the gospel through the original presenters, the disciples, the apostles, and believe. 
And then those who will hear the message from that group and so on and so on and so on, all through the generations, you and I are included in this prayer and Jesus is praying for us. He's praying, he's praying this, that all of them, don't miss that small little significant word, all. What does all mean? All means all. All means all of the Matthews and all of the Simons. All of the Republicans and all of the Democrats. All of the independents, all of the libertarians, all of the librarians, all, 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 all the way down the line, every single one of them, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Together, we come together and be the church. Jesus envisioned this kind of community built on love where somebody driving a BMW could sit right next to somebody who's driving a VW. <laughs> Y'all know what a VW is, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's this idea that no matter who you are, poor, rich, middle of the road, whatever, we can be together and come together and feel like we're a part of a body, a family. How many times does the word of God talk about us in terms of that, being a body? Bodies aren't amputated. Bodies are holistic. We come together as one, that they may be one. It's the same prayer. Now, I don't know about you. I look at this as, whew, this is a tall order. This is kind of tough, almost impossible to do. And the question, I guess, in my mind is, why is it so important to Jesus? This is such a seemingly over-the-hill kind of prayer request, something that just seems so beyond us, but why is it so doggone important to him? And he answers that by saying this, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world. You notice how many, uh, you know, so many so that's are in this passage. Uh, so that what? So that. So that the world might know. So that the world might come to know Christ. In other words, our unity is the best apologetic to the world that that the truth claims of Jesus are absolutely correct. That he is from God. He's the son of God. He's been sent from God. He is the savior of the world. Us being together is the best apologetic for that. And I, I kind of simply put, is that um, a splintered, a, a, a splintered group, a, a splintered movement will result in, in a, in a very sparse mission. We're, we're not gonna complete the mission. This is mission critical, in other words. Our being one, our coming together, throughout the ages, throughout the eras and the generations, us being together is mission critical for the continuation of the gospel to go forward. If the gospel isn't going forward, then we have to kind of step back and say, why is that so? Perhaps it's us. In other words, a church could kind of get along, right? You and I have been in churches. You know, my, my, my church back home, lovely bunch of people, but you know, they argued about things. They were divided about things. You know, here's this homogenous church and we kind of looked alike, but we still argued about things. We weren't a united church, even though I was from the United Methodist Church. It was called, we had united in our name, but we weren't united. And as a result, that little church, guess what? That little church is no more. That church doesn't even exist anymore in my little town back home. It, it died a long time ago. Churches die because they're not united. They don't come together. They don't, they don't follow what Jesus is talking about here. This is absolutely critical for us. He goes on to say this, I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one even as we are one. I and them and you and me so that they may be brought to complete unity. You know, we're not talking about necessarily dressing alike here, all getting the same tattoos, 
drinking the same Kool-Aid. We're not talking about those kinds of things. We're talking about this, again, this kind of agape love that needs to be present here in our midst, this unconditional love that that brings us together. This isn't even some kind of organizational unity. I remember years ago when um, certain denominations were kind of coming together as mergers. Did that change the world? Did the world look at that and say, whoo, wow, that's cool. Uh, You know, I don't even think the world was even paying attention. Did did the world do um, somersaults when Google took over Fitbit this past summer? Woo, look how much they love each other. No, (laughs) we're not talking about organizational structure or mergers. We're talking about loving on each other, caring about each other. We're about a kind of a a redemptive community where we're coming together and caring deeply for one another. Remember what 1 Corinthians 13 says? Love is patient, love is kind. It's not easily angered. It, does, it, it keeps no records of wrongs. It's that kind of community where we're, where we're experiencing that in a bold, supernatural, spiritual kind of way. He says this, Then, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. In other words, it's not going to be about what they believe about communion. It's not going to be about what they believe about baptism, who gets baptized, how much water. It, it's not about you know, figuring out when Jesus is coming, the when, what, who's, and, and uh, it's not about all that. It's about us being together as one, and that proves to the world that Jesus is real. Um, back during the days of the Reformation, it's not that the Reformers in that day, like Martin Luther, John Calvin, Zwingli, some of the great Reformers 500 years ago, that they always got this. But they were, in a sense, kind of committed to this motto that that was um, that was kind of prevalent during the day, and it it went like this: in essentials, unity; in non-essentials, liberty; in all things, charity. What, What that meant was this: they recognized that there were certain things, essentials of the faith. Now, in other words, if you go back to the ancient creeds, the, the, the early church, and, and the essentials that existed within those early creeds, even found in, in places like the book of Philippians and, and other books of the New Testament, these creeds, and that got kind of formulated out, written out in creeds like the Apostles' Creed that maybe some of you memorized when you were a child, and the Nicene Creed, essentials. We've come to know them as kind of the fundamentals of the faith. In other words, the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, the resurrection of Jesus, the return of Jesus. Not necessarily spelling out the who, what, whens, just knowing he's returning, he's coming back. And that salvation is found in Christ and Christ alone through faith in him. Period. That's it. Those are the essentials. And the reformers said, that's it. And if we believe those things, we're united. We're together. And all of the non-essentials, like baptism, beliefs about communion, all the other things that come underneath of that, are part of this kind of peripheral uh, understanding, the doctrines, even their politics. So in other words, politics and anything else was never raised to the level of the essentials. It's the essentials. Jesus is Lord. He he resurrected from the grave, and only in Jesus, only in him can we be saved. Those are the things that make us one, and we come together in those things. I loved what uh, J.G. Greenhuff says. He puts it eloquently when he says this. Simon and Matthew were divided from each other by a wide, deep gulf of thought and feeling, and even of impassioned hatred. Yet the tax collector and the zealot clasped hands and joined hearts at Jesus' feet. In the furnace of his love, these opposites were welded together. Opposites welded together. And what about that early church? What about those early disciples? They changed the world. And you know what the world said of the early church? Look how much they love one another. 
There was such a unity in those first three centuries of, of Christian expansion. It was just the world had never seen. The world doesn't understand and know and experience that same kind of, of unity and togetherness that was seen in the early church. And that's exactly what the world saw. And that's, that's precisely why, in my opinion, why the world was influenced and why so many came to know Jesus in those early years. Is the church united today? Sadly, not so much, right? So can we kind of say maybe this is the point, this is the point of it all, that the church is one, the world is one rather, when the church is one. When we start figuring it out together and getting together and coming together and uniting together underneath the banner of Christ's love, united in the essentials, that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. That much we know, right? That, that, that's what we experience together. Then the world looks at that and says, they're different. They, they don't seem like the people that we know who, who are in culture and so divided. They're together. So, so would you make it would you make it a prayer request this week? Uh, how about through this whole series? How about through until the election, maybe even after? For some of us, I gotta tell you, I just gotta admit to you, this is not always my prayer. It needs to be. What if you and I, every single day, prayed for oneness? Prayed for this church. Prayed for similar churches that, ha that hold those same essentials and that we would be one together. And, and maybe the prayer goes simply like this. Here it is. Heavenly Father, make us one so that we can influence many. Can we just say that together? Heavenly Father, make us one so that we can influence many. Just the simple prayer every day to say, God, a lot's riding on this. The soul of my neighbor, the soul of my son or daughter, the souls of people in my, my workplace. They need to see the church, one. They need to see us together. So let's, let's pray for that. And then secondly, maybe you'd, you know, look for opportunities to love unconditionally someone whom you disagree politically. And maybe you say, well, you know, Doug, I don't know anybody who disagrees with me politically, and that's the problem. <laughs> Maybe we need to start getting to know some of the people around us, even in this church, that disagree with us about the issues and start dialoguing and start loving on them. Instead of being online and on Facebook, degrading them, how about instead on Facebook, we start to talk about our allegiance to Jesus and our love for one another on Facebook. Wouldn't that be cool? Instead of, instead of pointing fingers at one another on, on, online, how about we start just lifting one another up online and, and start talking about how wonderful each other are? That'd be so much better. So what happened to Matthew and Simon? Some of you might say, you know, Pastor, this is really naive of you to think this way because this is just impossible. Yeah, is it? What about Matthew? And what about Simon? You know, after chapter one of Acts, they fade off into church history. They're not spoken of anymore in the New Testament after Acts chapter one. But legend tells us that they went together to Egypt. Go figure. A tax collector and a zealot. <laughs> Sounds like the beginning of a good joke, doesn't it? They went off to Egypt together for the gospel. They split there, and Simon went off to uh, 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 Great Britain, uh, Spain, then Great Britain, and ultimately he landed in a little town that was known as London and reached people for the gospel of Jesus Christ in London. Um, Matthew went to Ethiopia and there martyr, was martyred in Ethiopia. Simon martyred in London. Um, Simon 
uh, I'm sorry, Matthew uh, martyred in Ethiopia. Both gave their lives for the sake of the gospel. One mission, make disciples. We call it the Great Commission. And one commandment, the great commandment known as love one another even as I have loved you. That's what funneled and fueled them into changing the world. It can happen today. So let's think about these things. And most importantly, most of all, come back next week for part two. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning and for this privilege and opportunity to talk about these things. God, we recognize that we live in a world that is so desperately divided. People are uh, angry. People are critical of one another. And Lord, we're praying that we will not be like them, that we will somehow rise above all of the divisiveness that is out there in our world and that we could be the difference. Lord, most of all, we're praying that, Je that they would see Jesus, that they would see you and us together as a community, a community that loves on each other and cares about each other. We thank you. Make us one, Lord. We pray in the great name of Jesus. Amen. Let's watch this video. The mission carries with it an urgency to meet the needs